You are listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today, we're in La Caverne du Pondeur. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. And we're joined again by Francois Thomaso. Hello. No, it's, it's a nice area. Beautiful yeah. area, isn't it? Lavender yeah. fields, beautiful. Ideal for cycling. Oh, yeah. wonderful. But very, very windy, and that was a factor in today's stage. It's been a strange day on the Tour de France. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment, but first of all, let, let's have... The, the race did go on, and let's have the tail of the attack. OK, thank you, Richard. Yes, yeah, stage 13, an individual time trial from Bourges saint andéol to La Caverne du Pont d'Arc, 37.5 kilometres, um, and... It was, as you say, Richard, very windy out on the course, very rolling um, with, the, with all, most of the climbing in the first half of the course. Perhaps not a surprise that Tom de Moulin won, and he won convincingly by over a minute. He was ahead of Chris Froome. Nelson Oliveira, the Portuguese rider with Movistar, was third. Jerome Coppel of France was fourth, and Rohan Dennis was fifth. Surprisingly, not so good for Tony Martin, who was ninth, and Fabian Cancellara, who was 23rd, former world individual time trial champions of the top 10 the outstanding performances were Adam Yates who lost only 158 to Chris Froome and Balka Mollema who lost only 51 seconds um, but Chris Froome has strengthened his grip on the yellow jersey Peter Sagan is still in green Thomas De Gent is still in the polka dots and Adam Yates is now convincingly in the white jersey well we'll hear later on from Balka Mollema from Adam Yates and White Poles we'll also hear from uh, some of the Sports directors Mark Strajan, Valerio Piva, and also Lawrence Tendam, the, the rider. Uh, we spoke to some of these guys about the stage and some of them about the drama on Mont Ventoux and whether the correct decision was taken. We'll talk a bit about that as well coming up. We should talk first about what a, an awful 24 hours for for France and the question this morning of whether the stage would, would go on. And there were two issues, I suppose. One was respect for the victims of the terrible... A terrorist attack in, in Nice and the other was security. The tour is obviously vulnerable but also the security services, the police that the tour relies on so heavily that, that line the route and make sure starts and finishes are secure and we have been talking the last couple of days about the increased security on the tour. There are certainly more police in Montpellier. It was Bastille Day and, and you know that was also a, a factor perhaps in this in this terrible attack but Francois have you ever it's been a very strange day, and have you ever experienced that before on your many tours? Yeah, well, once, actually, I, I can remember was uh, the day after Fabio Casartelli died. Uh, the next day, there was no no stage, you know, they, they, the, 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 the stage was cancelled, and everybody was in shock, because that's not very very often, fortunately, that a rider dies on the Tour de France, so... Of course, the, what happened yesterday is much more horrific than the, the death of just one person, you know, doing his job as a bike rider, but um, th- that's the only instance I can remember of uh, a stage being, all, not, not only talk of the, the, the stage being cancelled, but a, a stage being, being actually cancelled. I remember the day after uh, Lance Armstrong won the stage in Limoges and pointed uh, mm. to the sky to uh, in homage to uh, Casartelli. It, it, it was dreadful, but today was, was a little bit different, and I think that, that uh, well, the organizers were in two minds. Uh, Christian Prudon said something interesting. He said that they asked, they really asked themselves whether to cancel the stage, which is uh, a, a, well a bit strange in 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 the sense that since we've had terror attacks in France, and uh, well we've had far too many now, uh, you know the reaction of the authorities has always been, or most of the time, it, it it has been to say life must go on. You know the show must go on. If we yield to the uh, terrorists, then. Uh, they've, they've won, you know, and I think that part of the decision today was we've known from the start that there was a, there's, there's danger, there's a threat around the tour, that the tour is vulnerable, and uh, that and it, well, someday it might happen that we have a terror attack on the tour, but the, the, the threat is no is not is not stronger now than it was yesterday, and the deci- the, deci- the decision was to to to, to yeah, for the race to go on. Uh, most riders, you know. You could see f- felt very emotional about uh, t- today. The, the, uh, Romain Bardet was saying he couldn't sleep. Tom Dumoulin had really, you know, emotional words about it. Even Chris Froome. I mean, he, he only spoke, you know, about 
well, one sentence about the, the what happened yesterday in his press conference. So everybody was moved about it. But maybe the, the best way to, 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 to counter a terror attack is, is, is keep on doing what you do best. If you're a musician, play uh, music. If you're a rider, ride your bike. I think that's probably the way to handle the situation best. Well, Froome lives just along the coast, of course, in Monaco, as a lot of riders do, and a lot of riders, of course, who live in, in Nice as well, a lot of the American riders. So for them particularly, and I think Froome was, was pretty moved by, by what happened. It was, it was such a strange day, though. It was a, a, a flat sort of atmosphere. It was more difficult for people to get to the, the course because there was more security around it. It, we also, it also came just after the, the drama, the sporting drama, really, although you know that involved some potentially some unruliness in the crowd on Mont Ventoux. So it was odd, wasn't it, coming just after that as well? Yeah, but I do think the tour organisers handled it very well. Um, there was a sombre atmosphere, a, a respectful atmosphere. The publicity caravan fell silent. Well, I wonder um, why it ran at all, to be honest. Well, I mean, it's part... It's it's part of the it's part of the tour, isn't it? As Francois says, the show goes on. Um, but the, you know, there was a mark of respect. A lot of the riders were uh, had black armbands, uh, and I noticed Adam Yates had a black armband on his white jersey this evening. And the podium presentations were very subdued and and struck the right tone, really. I mean, it, as you say, sport really is almost irrelevant uh, in the immediate aftermath of something like this attack. And yet, it's. It's uh, it's uh, interwoven into our culture, isn't it? It's what people do. It's a, it's a it's a Friday after Bastille Day. I don't know whether people would be back to work today or off work, but the the Tour de France is part of the French well, summer. It's a symbol, isn't it, of 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 France? Well, it's more than a sporting event, and so and again, that's what we always think makes it uniquely vulnerable. You know, but it's um it's so identified with 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 France itself, the con- the country, the culture. Absolutely, and so I think the show had to go on. Um, you know, where do you draw the line? When, in what circumstances could the decision have been different? Perhaps if we were closer to Nice, I don't know. But um, I think if the stage had been cancelled, you, you, you basically say we're giving up on um, you know all of the things that are are held dearly in the country. I guess. Christian Prudhomme, you know, the tour director, he says very often, and he said it again today, that the only thing that stopped the tour was the two world wars. So, in a way, to, to stop the tour today w- would have meant accepting that this is a third world war, which, is, which it might be, but it, it's not quite. So, the fact that the stage was not cancelled is, is also a way to, to, to say, no, this is not a third world war. The tour will go on because... You know, only a major conflict can can stop it, and and the tour is stronger than that. It's uh, I, I know there's been a long debate. I mean, there were there there was a meeting at the, the at the town hall of the Bourg Saint Andre with the prefect, all the authorities, the minister of uh, uh, well, the home of the the equivalent of the home of, uh, office. Uh, it, it took a, a long time to decide. I, I talked this morning to the policeman in charge of the security on the tour, called Eric Luzet, and he said that. Uh, they already had lots of, of people on the, on the course. There are 23,000 gendarmes along the road of the tour, uh, uh, along, well, along the tour. And uh, today there were more than 600 uh, policemen ar- around the course. And he said that they, they readjusted that, that, that their uh, security system to face the, the, the new threat. And, uh, well, I, I think that there was a threat uh, already. It had been uh, taken care of, but after what happened, I think probably the tour is even more secure than it was before when we started in Normandy, you know. And security issues um, related to the race are certainly high on the agenda as well. Christian Prudhomme has just walked past us. In fact, there's a, a reception, an official reception happening right beside us. So apologies if there's a bit of noise wafting over from there. There was a round of applause there a minute there ago. There was. That, that was for Francois' very statesmanlike um, analysis yeah. of the situation. We were actually drinking their wine as well, but um, that was <laughs> we, uh, after we'd helped ourselves to three glasses, we were told it was not for the press but for the officials, but never mind. Um, the stage did go ahead, and it, it was a crucial stage, you know, and it would have had an impact perhaps on the on the race, a big impact on the race had it not gone ahead because it was, it was the, the only long time trial, a very difficult time trial and you said Lionel that Dumoulin wasn't a surprise he won, I think it was a surprise he won by so much and it wasn't, we we played a little interview with him last night where he talked about this stage about how difficult it was, you know it started with a long climb and I think he showed again today that he 
is, you know, he's writing this tour, obviously, for Sage. That's his second Sage one in very different terrain. He's a very talented writer. Uh, we, you know, we we have been very impressed with him as a you know very eloquent speaker as well. But that yeah, was a, that he, was a huge statement today, I think. It was, yeah. And he made the point in the press conference, didn't he, that if he was riding for the GC, he wouldn't have been able to gain not gain that much time, but win by that much time because he's been able to save his legs a bit on the days that he's not targeting. He's able to really focus on very specific stages and today obviously was one of them and that asks the question really Rowan Dennis, Tony Martin Fabian Cancellara really quite a long way off and they should have had the Mm. they should have had the same sort of advantage over the GC riders but it didn't work out that way. You remember uh, you asked me at the end of last year who who was my favourite rider of the um, 2015 and I said Tom Dumoulin I was very impressed by him in the Vuelta he won two mountain stages and I think this guy in the future uh, as the, is the same type of rider as Jacques Antillo and Miguel in the rain is, is a time trialist who can become a, a, a Grand Tour winner he's, he's, uh, he's cute he's, he's a nice guy he's, 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 you know, he speaks very good English he's intelligent he's got, he, he really belongs to this new category of riders like Peter Sagan uh, like you know, the, the, well, this new Roman Bardet, all this new generation, we the, the class of 1990, you know, and he's uh, he's really, I really like this guy. I think, that, and you know what? In French, uh, Dumoulin means windmill. It was quite appropriate today, don't you think? I also like he he's intelligent, but he's also very straight. He he generally gives a very straight answer to a question. He was asked today, "Does this make you the favorite for the time trial in Rio?" And he paused and he said. Yeah, I, th- I think it does. Yeah. <laughs> which well, which shows his confidence as well. Refreshing honesty, mm-hmm. because a lot of people would, would 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 fudge that and say, "Well, you know, there's always other guys." Who, you know, Froome is targeting that as well. But that was a convincing beating of Froome. Now, admittedly, Froome went for a little jog yesterday, so his legs might have been a bit sore. But <laughs> but still, it was impressive. Eurosport, the home of cycling. And now, pedaler du charm. Thank you very much to Eurosport for sponsoring the cycling podcast and sponsoring our Peddler de Charme Award. Uh, we haven't even thought about Peddler de Charme today. It didn't really seem like the right thing to do, so we don't have a Peddler de Charme today, though we did announce two last night, one for Mark Cavendish, one for Chris Froome. The Mark Cavendish one proved controversial because I said it was for getting bottles from the car for his teammates, and a few people pointed out that I, I didn't consider Andrew Greipel for that award a few days ago because he'd done on the basis that that's, that's his job. I have to say that the other reason for not giving it to Greipel was that he got it last year. Ah, I see. Yep. And he wasn't, a very, he wasn't a very gracious recipient of it, was he, really? Not Greipel. terribly, no. The, ju- so, the jury has spoken. Once bitten, twice shy. <laughs> the jury has spoken. Well, Peddler de Charme will resume tomorrow. We did, did manage to get a Peddler de Charme t-shirt to Mark Cavendish, so we'll post that picture tomorrow. Chris Froome is it's on its, it's winging its way to Chris Froome. Well, mentioning the jury of the Pedalo de Charme, the Tour de France jury and the UCI commissaires had a heck of a job to do at Chalet Reynard yesterday, didn't they? Francois, what was your take on, on the whole incident that unfolded on one one two? I mean, it's one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen on the Tour de France. I mean, what, what happened to Chris Froome? I mean, to, all of a sudden, we were all, you know, in the, in the press room. It was unreal because because obviously because the camera went blank and at the end of this blank moment you had the impression remember that the, the, uh, the twilight zone that that, 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 that oh, we've taken control of your TV set or, or something they said at, at first and that was the impression you had that all of a sudden we we got into the, the twilight zone you know, because you had a cycle race and all of a sudden you you, you have the guy you know uh, on in this yellow jersey running uh, 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 up the, the mountain with the, the number one on his back and 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 the you know the bemused crowd watching this didn't guy. know what was it happening was, i mean it was absolutely and, and especially the, the most striking thing was there was no bike it had gone you know and there was no uh, at first you know mm. no, no no notion of where it, where it was so uh well there was a, the first impression then of, of course there was a controversy should uh chris Froome still be wearing the yellow jersey or not or whatever i put I'm, I'm in two minds about that. I think that uh, we can discuss, discuss the rules. I, I'm, I'm not a specialist enough. I, I don't have the UCI uh, rules PDF on my uh, computer, and I can't check every single point, you know. So, and I suppose we're all the same. But I, I suppose that if they took the decision, uh, it was, uh, you know, the, the, when the referee decides, you should always respect the referee's decision. And, and if you, 
sports-wise, it's obvious that yesterday Chris Froome, Malcolm Malema and Richie Porty were the best men in the bunch. And it would have been absolutely absurd to see Nairo Quintana, who, was, who showed nothing at all yesterday, nothing at all today and nothing at all since the, start, the tour started, to see this guy in front of, of them. The only little uh, detail we could have... Uh, the, the little problem is Bauke Molema. He had managed to sneak through this mess and gain time, and I, I can understand he, he, he was a little bit furious uh, well, last night. looking at it, he was t there were 23 seconds ahead, roughly, when the incident happened. Molema finished 19 seconds ahead of Adam Yates, who was first again of the, of the leading group uh, behind. And you think, well, Molema was on the ground, he got back up and he got going again, and he had still had 19 seconds. That suggests to me that they would have had more than 23 seconds on the line. Now, we've had a bit of correspondence from people, you know, Facebook messages and emails, from people saying Froome should be disqualified because he, hasn't, he has not covered the whole course on a bike. Now, th but that, would, that assumes that he gained some kind of advantage by running, I think. And, and it, it, to me, it would be absurd to, to penalise Froome for, for what happened. Yeah, I mean, I can understand it being a talking point and technically... Um, you know, the rule is that you have to cross the line with your bike you have to cover the whole course with your bike and there was a period when he was running um, between the point where he'd lent his Pinarello against uh, a, a motorbike I think and, and collected the, the Mavic neutral service bike but I have to say it kind of surprised me a bit because up there at Chalet Reynard absolutely no one this was not on the agenda at all no one was saying oh is there going to be a Throw controversy about yeah, Chris Froome um, getting in trouble for not covering the course on his bike? I mean, that was so far down the agenda, so far down the list of priorities for the tour organisers and, and the jury, I would suggest. It didn't, uh, no one I spoke to was even, you know, it didn't cross anybody's minds actually up there. Um, I'm sure in the kind of cool, calm moment, people watching from afar perhaps, you know, thinking, well, the rule is the rule, surely they should adhere to that rule. Um, I think in the sort of the, the heat of the moment, it would have been utterly absurd to have penalised Chris Froome for that incident because he, you know, yes, he panicked. You can argue whether it would have been more efficient for him to just wait and get a bike. Or it, well, it would. It would have been. It would have, it would have been. been better for him to run back down the hill towards yeah. a bike sure. yeah. coming. That would have been better. It, my impression is that you, that there were three major points that made this decision uh, happen because first of all, uh, the organisers. You know, there was a, a, a obviously obviously mistake by the organisers. The way that the, 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 the no barriers were there, so they said that because of the wind, you know, uh, the, 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 the the barriers couldn't stand, and they, they they were forced to remove them. But obviously, there was uh, something, you know, there was a blunder by the organisers. So, secondly, the, the motorbike that you know that that's that well that they run into that Richie Port hits was a France Television. Uh, motorbike and France Television rule the, uh, the the show. They run this the, this race. Okay, that's the, the second point. And third, you have the yellow jersey. That's you know uh, like uh, you know the, the only uh, robe. You know, there's something you, you you can't touch. It's untouchable. So you have the three things that made. It, you, my impression is that the commissaires and the organizers they wanted to make. Uh, believe nothing had happened and if you want to erase all that and say okay let's do as if nothing had happened the only decision you can make is to say okay the, the race stopped at, the ver at that very moment and everything that happened afterwards you didn't see you mentioned there the organizers they had to act very quickly overnight to re take down and then reconstruct the entire Tour de France six kilometres down the mountain the only other alternative would be to say we're not running the stage, the wind is too high we're going to cancel the stage because they haven't, they haven't got the infrastructure to suddenly recreate the, the Tour de France in the, in the time available, it clearly wasn't possible had it been possible they would have, would have done so I'm sure, but we did have a very interesting email in from a listener called Floyd Milligan and his idea was really um, quite innovative and it caught our attention didn't it rich when we read it um because the the issue is the number of people on the mountain and all getting so close to the riders narrowing the road down to really a bike length and his width. idea sorry a bike width <laughs> of course um his idea was um that advanced of the race the day before some kind of vehicle goes up and paints tram lines on the road um didn't 
basically denoting the racing zone. So however wide that would be, I don't know, the width of a car plus a little it bit more. It will, work, it will work in England because you're a disciplined uh, nation. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but, the, but, the rule of, but surely, Francois, the rule of the crowd would come into play and there would be an element of self-policing because everyone would then know where the line clear. is and, and anyone who's over the line could be brought back into check. It would give the gendarmes something to say, hey, you're over the line, you're out, or, mm. you know, they, they could slowly change it because this isn't, this, this isn't a logistical issue this is a cultural issue and it's I think we've point. had a, a couple of points well, from people we're, we're one of the, the guys who helps us on the, the podcast Paul Shafter called me this morning and he, he said that it doesn't happen at the Flanders Classics where you have as many people drinking as much arguably you know alcohol is certainly part of the, the culture there in terms of going out and enjoying the race but there isn't the same issue of packing the roads getting in the rider's way running alongside the riders, interfering with the action. That doesn't happen at, at those races, whereas it does happen at the Tour de France uniquely. And we always sort of put it down to the, the size of the crowd, but is that the issue or is, is it a cultural phenomenon? And I think that's a really excellent idea. Oops. <laughs> oh, I mean... Where, where the uh, wind caused a major accident the in the cycling podcast. My uh, glass of red wine <laughs> just, <laughs> just spilled over the table. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, what's that noise? Sounds like the free boss file, our old comrade Daniel Freeb. I hope he's not going to mention his contact lenses again. Good evening, chaps. And it's good to be back, in fact, after my enforced two or three day hiatus. I specify enforced because I have actually been ill again. Um, always happens in the Tour de France. This year it was food poisoning. Haven't actually been able to eat for three or four days. Um, I know what mental and physical resources it requires to be on the podcast. So I didn't feel that I could do myself justice. Oh my word, what is that noise? Oh, it's the Rai television lorry being deflated. Anyway, um, here I am. I'm back and I am fighting fit and I'm going to deliver three or four conclusions from today's time trial. First one, Movistar have almost admitted, conceded defeat in this Tour de France. Had a few conversations today, or had a couple of conversations with their team manager, Eusebio Unzue. He's very defeatist, he's very pessimistic about their chances, and Nara Quintana's chances of getting back into the fight for the yellow jersey at this Tour de France. Quintana lost more minutes today, he did a reasonable time trial, a respectable time trial, but Unzue feels that everything they've thrown at Team Sky so far has been batted back with interest, and that will probably continue to be the case, because Team Sky seems to be operating their rotational policy, again, where they use different domestics for different parts of the race, and they've got a few guys waiting in the wings to, to ride very strongly, I think, in the final week, Walt Powers is one of them, I think Mikel Landa might be another, so Unzue is not very hopeful of Naira Quintana turning this around, Second conclusion, Balka Molema is the Stephen Kreiswijk of this Tour de France. Stephen Kreiswijk, of course, is the byword now for the dark horse who really surprises everyone in a Grand Tour. After what Kreiswijk did at the Giro d'Italia, I think that Molema might even outdo him here. Molema is very much in contention for podium place now and might even, might even prove to be Chris Froome's closest challenger and toughest opponent in the Alps. I think the Alpine stages might suit Monoma. They're quite short, quite punchy. Um, he's got the experience now of having tried to finish on the Tour de France podium and failed. Um, I think he's more mature now. He's in a different team. He doesn't have quite the media scrutiny um, in an American team as he did in a Dutch team um, when he was riding for Blanco and prior to that, Rabobank. So all looking good for him. Final conclusion is that the subplot that people are not paying enough attention to at this Tour de France is the I wouldn't say it's a cold war but I would say that um, the internal I wouldn't even say it's rivalry but the kind of binary path that BMC is on with TJ Van Garden and Richie Port. very interesting to observe their body language at the moment I watched them come in after their time trials they retreated to opposite sides of the warm down cordon or paddock that BMC had set up and um, yeah I wouldn't say I wouldn't say there was tension or terseness in, in the air, but I wouldn't say that they're best buds either and they're right behind each other. I think the situation there at the moment is still very vague and BMC still don't really know who their strongest rider is. Quite different characters, I think, Van Garder and Port, and it'll be interesting to see how that one develops over the last couple of days. My evening from this point is going to develop towards, as I said earlier, first meal for a while. So I'm quite looking forward to that. Um, I know that 
food poisoning for Lionel must be a fate worse than death. I've been a lot more sanguine about it, a lot more phlegmatic about it. Nonetheless, I'm quite looking forward to chowing down this evening. Um, also looking forward to see you guys. Richard, looking forward to getting my contact lenses. What are we now? It's almost the end of week two, still not got them. Come on, sort yourselves out. You are listening to The Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. Wherever you are, wherever you ride, whatever the reason, Rafa exists to improve your ride. With the finest kit, inspiring stories, and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. See rafa.cc for more information. Thank you very much to Rafa for sponsoring us at the Tour de France. Wonderful partners that they are. Do follow their alternative coverage of the Tour de France at rafa.cc our hashtag more than race on Twitter every day something fascinating there unfortunately Francois is so disappointed by his spilling his red wine that he's just left he's, he's done a chiro and done a runner no he had to leave he had to leave us unfortunately but lovely to have his input and we'll we'll have him back again just a couple of uh, points from yesterday before we move on to today, Rich. You wanted to say something about Nairo Quintana. Well, footage, I mean, we, we explained last night how tricky yesterday was. I mean, Francois was in the press room, so he saw a lot more of the stage than we did. It was very challenging up the mountain to see what was going on. There weren't TV screens, um, there was no phone signal or Wi-Fi or anything. So, you know, we, our little discussion about the incident involving Movistar and Sky, for example, when there was a crash around, I believe, around 30 kilometres from the finish, involving Luke Rowe and Ian Stannard, and Chris Froome stopped for a, a call a call of nature, and Fabian Cancellara apparently remonstrated with uh, Valverde um, at the front of the bunch. Now, that's, that that would have been a massive talking point had mm. the incident on Von 2 not happened, because... Yes, it's etiquette for the, the, the bunch to slow down when the yellow jersey stops, stands for the call of nature, but not in the last 30 k's. So that, that was an odd one. And I think maybe uh, uh, you know a question that needs to be asked of Chris Froome at, at some point. You know, I think the bunch waits for the yellow jersey if he crashes. He doesn't wait. They don't wait for his teammates. So that was an odd one. Um, and, you know, I so say we didn't see it. So it, it's difficult for us to have um, covered it in any kind of... Uh, authoritative fashion but we'll continue to sort of follow up on that one in particular because there's a bit of needle between Movistar and Team Sky that's for sure the other incident that emerged today on footage uh, that was posted on social media was of Nairo Quintana holding on to the Mavic motorbike the, uh, one of the wheels on the Mavic sort of neutral service motorbike as it weaved its way negotiated through the, the crash that involved Froome, Molima and, and Richie Port. That it's very clear Quintana is holding on to the motorbike. Now, I am inclined to give him the benefit of the doubt that he was doing it in order to avoid stopping and just to get through the mess. We don't have, we don't know how long he, he held on to the bike for. That's clearly crucial. Um, and I can see that it's, it's clearly wrong. You don't hold on to a vehicle. But it was, it was exceptional and bizarre circumstances. And if he, if he only held on for a few seconds in order to remain upright through that mess, then... I'm inclined to sort of give him the benefit of the doubt and, and overlook it. But if he held on for any length of time, then that's a disqualification offence. I mean, Vincenzo Nibali was disqualified from the Vuelta for holding on to a team car for an extended period of time last year. Yeah, but again, we don't know, do we? That's the danger of these clips appearing, you know, a, a handful of seconds of Quintana holding on to uh, the wheel that was on that bike. You know, isn't isn't really enough to, to draw any kind of conclusion. But just while we're talking about Mavic, a lot of people have also been asking about um, the the Mavic, the bright yellow Mavic bike that Chris Froome rode for a few hundred meters, perhaps. And questions about those. I mean, the 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 blunt answer is that. That ma- those Mavic bikes on that Mavic car really are there for advertising purposes. They're I never mean, used, are they? <laughs> no, They've been there, the same bikes for 50 years. I, I can't remember a time when uh, anyone's really had to use them. Um, certainly not the yellow jersey in the t- <laughs> you know, on, a, on, the, on a massive mountain stage. I mean, uh, Mavic are one of the tour's sponsors and partners. They do provide some neutral service and they have a range of wheels to... But, but really, those bikes are not there. You know, there isn't, there isn't the, really the possibility to have all of the different size of the bikes and crucially the, the pedals that the riders use yeah, you'd be up there with, with five or six different t- types of pedals it'd be on. better off on one of our 
nano folding bikes or Leos nano <laughs> folding bikes. He really would have been. Seamless. Little Seamless. plug there for the lovely bikes. That Just we're the very last couple of things because we rushed through the tail of the etap a little bit. There's a bit more business to catch up on because Simon Gerrans was out of the race. Um, I did see him come back to the Orica Bike Edge bus yesterday evening, really battered up. Mm. Um, but uh, again, it wasn't a talking point yesterday. But... Uh, because so much else went on but he it's been confirmed he's broken his collarbone and he is out of the Olympic Games a few more withdrawals a couple more withdrawals today Thibaut Pino didn't start the time trial because he has bronchitis and uh, Edvard Toynes of the Trek uh, Segafredo team he crashed in the time trial and pulled out and the, the time trial itself today held in such windy conditions and winds were gusting at 60 kilometres an hour and, and often were you know 40 kilometres an hour I was amazed to see riders using disc wheels, and I spoke to Lawrence Tendam about a number of things. We'll hear that shortly. Uh, but he, made, he said he wasn't going for the stage. The priority was to stay upright and have an, a completely open wheel. And it was interesting to see which riders. I mean, Adam Yates had, uh, he had a disc, I think, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, Walt Pools, who I spoke to, had a disc. So we hear from Walt Pools. I asked him a bit about the, the time trial and also about the, the general atmosphere, because he was part of the Team Sky team last year that, that was on the end of some abuse from the fans. There are, there are rumours that that's been going on again this year, but... Uh, Team Sky haven't gone public with it. They're they're keen to address it with ASO rather than make a big song and dance. About yeah, it. I can understand why they're keen to play that down. But there, there was an, a, an atmosphere at the uh, Chalet Reynard when it was announced that Chris Froome was going to get the yellow jersey. There was some hissing and a bit there of there was booing. some nastiness around the bus as well from people. Um, it, it, you know, th- this hostility towards Froome in particular. Is, yeah, if, if there's not sympathy from after an incident like yesterday, then I'm not sure there ever there ever will be Um, now whether he deserves that or not I mean nobody deserves that sort of hostility but it's clearly a a product of a suspicion that's out there about Froome and that suspicion is generated by a lot of quite influential people in the media and on social media I think um, who need to be sure that what they're saying is factually correct and that there's evidence for what they're saying I think because it's created a a real culture of of nastiness and and as I say suspicion around Froome which as far as I'm aware, is unfounded. There aren't any. There is no evidence that Froome is a cheat and a doper. No evidence has emerged. If there is evidence, let's have it. This is another issue. It'll be no doubt an issue in the Alps as well. Let's hear from Wout Pools, Chris Froome's Team Sky teammate at the finish. How was it today? First of all, how was how big a, a problem was the wind out there? Oh, like really unbelievable. Uh, for me, it was quite difficult to stay on my bike at some parts in the downhill and. Um, I was happy that I could control my bike. You had a disc wheel, I think, didn't you? Uh, yeah, in the back, in the, f- uh, in the front, like a lower wheel. But uh, normally in the back, it's it's like okay, but maybe it was also for me yeah. today better to have like a normal wheel. But like, yeah, the condition was not uh, the most uh, ideal to, to do a TT. What, what was your take on yesterday? Do you think the correct decision, fair decision was taken in the end? I think so. If you talk about fair play and you see how the crash happened, I think it was a uh, one and only good decision they could make and I mean uh, nobody want to make decisions like that but also nobody want to have like a crashes like that like with the crowd and a motorbike so yeah I think it was a good decision How was Chris last night? Uh, I didn't saw him so mu- uh, didn't saw him so much I went straight to dinner and massage but he was this morning he looked okay and hopefully yeah he can handle oh, He's not got sore legs after the running has he? Yeah, I was also wondering that, like muscle pain, like uh, we never train on that, so <laughs> so yeah, we will see today. Well, how, you were part of the Tour de France team last year and there were problems that Sky had with some of the fans. What, what's it been like this year? Uh, I think the crowd is doing quite okay. Yesterday I had a few more bad things, but you know, I mean, well, yeah, uh, it doesn't matter who you want to support, but if you keep it that, uh, I think they're doing okay. How, how does that affect you, though? I mean, as, as a rider, as part of this team, where, where there is that, that sort of attitude from some people? Yeah, I always try to see it as a compliment. I mean, if they don't support us, then normally we're in yellow. So that's a good sign for us. So, yeah, you know, it's, it's never nice, but yeah, uh, apparently it's a little bit part of it. So we have to deal with it. Just finally, the way that Sky have been riding, it seems to have been alternating guys in the mountains. You've been up there, you know, one of the last men, some days and some other days it's been Nieve. Is that a deliberate sort of strategy, this race? Yeah, it's a little bit like we have a really strong lineup and Chris have to be good every day and we can sometimes someone else take it over 
like yesterday it was me uh, the first week in the ever and yeah it's just really nice to ride like that and, and help each other like that so you get days off yeah <laughs> like today well sticking with the dutch riders because they've had a heck of a day um Let's hear now from Lawrence Tendam about Mont Ventoux because he featured in our uh, special episode on Mont Ventoux, which we released on Monday. And also he was talking a little bit about the conditions out on the road today. Lawrence, back in March when I spoke to you about Mont Ventoux, you called it a crazy mountain. Yeah. It was crazy I was, yesterday. Uh, I was right, no? <laughs> I think I was right. Yeah, it was even more crazy yesterday. I, uh, because all the public, which is normal, stretched out in the last 6K, came to Chaleur and I, and that's caused the problem. And also the no barrier politics was also a problem, of course. Yeah, what happened is a shame for uh, for cycling, no? And also, yeah, then the jury takes decisions, but you never can make it for everybody, right? So, big discussion about it. I feel really sorry for uh, for my friend Bauke Mollema, of course. Because uh, he's in the form of his life and then things like that happen, you know. On the other side, uh, I think the jury made the right decision also to put uh, Froome in the same time because this is yeah, crazy. Yeah, but when you see the the yellow jersey running running on the mountain like the moment too, I think it's one for history. It certainly is. I mean, do, do you think anything can be done about the, the crowds when there's that many people on the mountain? Ah, for sure, they, uh, they have to put more barriers, last 2K, which they do normally, like today. <laughs> I mean, there was not so many people today, but maybe some, uh, how say that, maybe some, yeah, to teach the people what to do, you know. Also yesterday in the Gruppetto, we got a standstill because of a small crash, because of the public, and then... I was with the foot out of the cleats on the ground and people started to push me, but I couldn't go further. But those people were really drunk. And uh, I think uh, you always have to keep your mind inside. But on the other hand, I wouldn't like to miss the public because uh, I love it to be cheered for and that gets the best out of me, you know. What was it like today? So so windy again today. Was it difficult on the time trial bike? Uh, I must admit the most difficult part today for me was uh, to go from the hotel to the start because I still had full disc wheel and everything on the TT bike. Even more wind from the hotel to the start, towards the start. The Mistral was really going in the uh, in the Provence and uh, I almost uh, I was terrified to come here because uh, I was almost blown off the way a few times but then the TT was okay, it was more covered and... Did you did you just have a disc? Uh, you had a full disc in the rear, no? I had everything full open, as open as possible, because I didn't want to take any risk. Because it's a day when, with a disc, the wrong gust of wind could uh, cause yeah, a crash. Yeah, We've seen a couple of guys crashing today. Yeah, they crashed. I don't know. But on the other hand, I think Tom did full disc, because if you want to win, you have to take risk. And uh, I hope he's winning. We'll see. Okay, so that was Lawrence Tendam. We're going to go to a third Dutch rider now. Incredible. This wow. Is du- this is a Dutch episode. We need Dan Hackenberg back on at we some point. We do need Dan at some weekend. point. It's all about the Dutch. But uh, Balka Mollema, fantastic ride today. And he, you know, a couple of years ago, was it 2013 when he was riding really, really well in the Tour? And well, yeah. He was sitting second at one point. Well, Tendam and Mollema were teammates then. That's and right. they obviously rode incredibly well on Mont Ventoux that year. Mollema was very good in the time trials that year yeah. as well. And so today's result perhaps isn't the There was the a surprise. very good Dutch Find the Wall documentary about the what was then the Belkin team and, and it focused a lot on Mollema and Tendam. And Mollema was, was looking really good for maybe for the podium in 2013 he fell ill in the final week and really struggled this you know this is not a surprise to see him performing like this perhaps he's not the most elegant looking rider but he's very strong and he's going extremely well and here's what he had to say at the finish oh, I should say before we, we play this interview that he featured of course in our book club Kilometer Zero where he said that four or five days into tour he'd already read two books he had four or five more to tide him, tide him over so here he is at the finish today I'm, I'm a little bit heavier, I think, than, than some of the other GC guys. And uh, yeah, I, I think I'm used to, to ride in the wind uh, where I live in Holland. It's always windy. So, so I think it was, was, was an advantage for me. It was, was windy like this. And, uh, but it was still a really hard, hard time trial, you know. Uh, the start was uphill, the finish was uphill. So I think, uh, yeah, it, it may be the best city in my life. So I'm really happy. No, it's not revenge, you know. Yesterday... Uh, 
was another day and uh, <laughs> it was hectic. Uh, I think I was happy yeah, even after the crash. You never know how the body reacts. And uh, I, well, I didn't feel anything from, from that. So uh, I was just, uh, it was just a great day. How did you feel last night, Valka, in terms of calming down after the stage and all, all that happened? Did you find it easy to kind of switch off after all that? Yeah, that was quite difficult, you know. It was, uh, it was a hectic evening, uh, a lot of uh, reactions, of course, uh, after what happened yesterday. And uh, I couldn't really fall asleep uh, well. I, yeah, I, I have that often, that, that, that I don't sleep so well in the tour. So uh, You've got like, your books to read, of course, as we yeah, discussed yeah. last week. <laughs> this morning, uh, I think I slept 45 minutes, uh, you know, uh, just two hours before my TT. So I was relaxed and uh, that was a good sign, you know. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I calmed down uh, today and uh, did the recon this morning, and uh, yeah, I was really focused uh, focused on uh, on doing a great TT. So that was Balka Molema. While we're doing these playing these little interviews, let's hear. I spoke to Marc Sergent, the Belgian this time, director at Lotto Soudal at the finish, just to get his view on. They they have the stage winner, of course, at Mont Ventoux, Thomas de Gen, a, a, a win that was completely overshadowed by by everything that happened. Um, but I spoke to him about whether the right decision had been taken. I also spoke to Valerio Piva, about who's a sports director at BMC, about also whether the correct decision had been taken and how his rider Richie Port fared today in the time trial. So here is Marc Sergent, followed immediately by Valerio Piva. It was obviously a very confusing situation. Yeah. Do, you think the, do you think the correct decision was, was taken in the circumstances? Well, actually, we, we were more busy with uh, the stage victory we had, <laughs> than, uh, but that, I don't know, it was a hard decision, I think. Um, if you saw the situation like it was in real time, it was correct. Of course, if you see the rules, it's a different thing. But uh, I think if we were in the same situation as uh, Astrum, I think like uh, Brailsford said, it's, it's a human correct decision. You were a writer yourself. You've experienced these crowds before. Has it, has the situation got worse? And what's the answer? Well, I think that it's not worse. Uh, the only thing was the stage was shortened by 6k, and all the fences were there, and not below. So uh, I think that was the big problem. No, no fences in the last uh, two, three k, and all the crowds were packed there. there was uh, no more space left. Is are there more incidents of of uh, spectators interfering with the riders than in the past do you think well you know a few days ago um, Froome hit hits somebody who ran uh, next to him I think this should be uh, always messages to the public to do do not to do that because it's uh, it's frightening if somebody crashes next to you into your wheel or hits somebody so uh, a true uh, supporter he should stand there and stay put not uh, running against uh, or with riders. It was a very complicated d- day yesterday. Do you feel the, the correct decision was, was taken in the circumstances? It was something that, uh, uh, that a situation like this uh, I never saw and it's difficult to let the race go like this. So I think the best was to the decision that they do. Uh, the three best that was, uh, that was on, on 1K, the situation was this and why penalize guys that they need, they are on the ground with uh, with a broken bike and uh, cancel the stage of, of start from zero was also not correct. Uh, so I think that was the most uh, uh, the most co- correct uh, way to 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 make this decision. So of course uh, maybe Molema he complained because he had time, uh, but. Uh, I think win time in, in a crash, no, nobody wants to, uh, to have this, so he was there at the top with the, the best, so I, he don't lose time, he, he don't win, but, so that is the way, I think. I mean, it was quite a nasty crash, did Richie feel some of the effects of that today, do you think? <laughs> Normally not, but uh, today we saw all the GC riders, they have more or less the same time, uh, for me the reason is the wind, this climber, the, 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 the guy, they are, uh, they have power in the climb so in the wind you need to have more weight uh, and power so uh, we saw the difference uh, the heavier guys they made b- better time of the climbers so that is the reason why we saw more or less all the contenders uh, in this position and but lost time from uh, from some others so i think 
it's nothing changed today. Well, there's still a lot. A lot. No, there's still a lot of climbing, obviously, and we saw the, yeah. the evidence has suggested that Richie is one of the strongest climbers in the tour. Is the podium uh, a a realistic goal for him? Uh, that is a podium is uh, is realistic, but uh, of course, the last week is very hard, and also the the next time trial is very hard. So. Uh, I think that this, for the moment, uh, uh, Froome is, is uh, dead. Uh, we saw a stronger Morema coming up, and for the rest, uh, the contender they are still uh, in the same position. Richie need to take back the, this time that he lost the, the first day with the flat, so he need to try. And of course, the last week is uh, is good for for him. So the parkour is good for him. So we will see. Wow, Rich, we're packing them in tonight. Let's talk about the other man of the moment, really, today. Um, Chris Froome obviously strengthened his grip on the yellow jersey, now in a commanding position, and, and the most likely pre-tour challenger, Nairo Quintana, is, he, well, he hasn't had a good day yet. I mean, he was so quiet in the first week, but he really, when he's needed to do something, he hasn't done anything, and he's lost another wedge of time today. One man that I expected to lose a fair fist of time with Adam Yates, not a noted time trialist. I think as a professional, today was the longest time trial he's ever done. I think he did a 34-kilometre time trial in the Vuelta a couple of years ago, maybe last year. Never troubled the top 50. And yet, here he is, I think 16th on the stage, 18th on the stage. Yes, he lost time to Chris Froome, but very, very respectable performance and still in a podium position at the moment, third overall. So let's just hear a little bit of his post-race reaction you know he he tells it how it is yeah today it went okay really everyone knows i'm not good i'm not great at time trialing so yeah i lost some time but i mean considering how small i am and you know uh how good i am at time trialing then um i didn't lose too much so now i'm happy with what i did it's also probably one of the longest time trials i've done so above the climbing sections i felt strong and i felt like i had the power it was just uh you know the crosswind crosswind sections and the and the flat with the rough road where i suffered quite a lot so yeah we did the max and uh, we came out okay so we had to fight we're here to fight another day it's a, it's a horrible situation what's happened and uh prayers and wishes go out to the families of everyone affected but uh yeah we had to do a job today and and uh we just had to turn up and do it so yeah so Adam Yates there, um, the surprise pack is nobody, and he said it himself, nobody would have expected him to be in the top three after this time trial because this final week on paper suits him, but whether he can do it over three weeks, it remains to be seen. He's only 23 years old. He, he's, I, he is a, I don't know if entertaining is the right word, but he's an interesting interviewee. He says it is it is what it is a lot. Like a, a, a page out of the Bradley Wiggins kind of notebook from 2012 where... Yep. said that a lot. The tour um, is a tour. The tour is a tour, it is what it is. Um, he also says, he also talks about we rather than I. Everything is we. Um, which is, some some writers do that. I don't, no, I'm, I, I, I get that it's a team effort. Um, but ultimately, the ride that, that Adam Yates is doing belongs to Adam Yates. It doesn't belong to a, a whole list of people. Much as they have no doubt helped and supported him. It belongs to him. Take ownership of it, Adam, is my advice if you're listening. Wow. You're probably not. Sports uh, career as a sports psychologist. No, I think it's psychology to say we because I think it um, it sort of absolves him of a bit of responsibility in a way. Mm. And and Mm. I think I don't know. I don't like it. Bradley Wiggins does it all the time. It's always we. I certainly say we when we've made a mistake and I when we've done something quite good. Well, Um, uh, yeah. (laughs) Now we should play out tonight. It has been a sad and somber day, but we we all need a bit of levity, a bit of humour in these in these times and. Lionel kindly provided that last night oh. when he went for dinner because you were staying on the outskirts of a beautiful, beautiful town of Orange. Yeah, let me just fill the backstory in here. We were in Orange, uh, which is about an hour's drive, an hour and a bit's drive from Mont Ventoux, and our colleague from The Telegraph, Tom Carey, had booked a hotel, but it would have meant we'd all be sharing a room. I mean, I think we'd have been top to tail, Rich, um, mm. in the on same a camp bed. bed. Yeah. On a camp bed. So I decided that the best thing to do would be book somewhere else so i booked uh, i won't i won't shame the brand but a real real budget 
hotel <laughs> out on the outskirts of Orange, next to the motorway. And um, I first got a, class, isn't it? Yeah, first class. Yeah, I got I got a text message telling me that the the manned reception would be closing, and and uh, I've had a disaster with these before, where you go and you have to put your credit card into a machine outside, and you've got oh, it sometimes goes wrong, and then you've got to call a number in Paris, and then they transfer you to a number somewhere else. I could all, I could see this happening, so I thought I'll head over there straight away. Uh, I drove in through the open gate, the big open gate. I checked in without a hitch, um, got the code for the car park gate uh, and planned to drive back into town to meet Richard, Tom and uh, our friend Simon, the photographer, for a lovely dinner in Orange. Unfortunately, when I got to the entry code thing on the gate, my code was not recognised and the gate wouldn't open. I tried to ring for a taxi, but it being Bastille night, there were no taxis. um, And so I had to reluctantly uh, concede defeat in my quest to get back into town for dinner. So I walked to the nearby McDonald's, which was about a kilometre away, and when I got there, it was closed, but the drive-thru was still open. (laughs) And so I had to go through the drive-thru on foot, Um, and there I was. I placed my order at the first window. You were were in a queue of cars, weren't you? Oh, yeah, shuffling shuffling up between the bumpers. Um, (laughs) As the car in front moved forward, I walked forward. Sounds very funny. (laughs) And you're smiling now, Lionel, but I understand at the time you were... But do you know the most galling thing? Is it had been such a sort of frantic, chaotic day and the drive down off the mountain and everything that happened, trying to process what happened and record the podcast and do everything we had to do. It had slipped my mind that we had a folding bike in the boot of the car. I could have just ridden from the hotel into Orange and joined you for dinner. But there we are. Yeah, and it was a lovely dinner, I have to say. I mean, you could have taken a, taken a leaf out of Froome's book and jogged it, run into town. No, no. In, in your cycling shoes. <laughs> you know, it would have been the perfect homage to Chris Froome's efforts, which, rightly, I think, David Miller paid a sort of tribute to today on Twitter. I think he did what it took to, to remain in the race. And as absurd and comical as it looked, Froome's run up Mont Ventoux, you, kind of, you look at it and kind of admire it. The, 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 you can see on his face the determination. And, you know, I think... As, as ridiculous as he looked, he deserves a lot of respect for, for the way he fought. He was prepared to fight to, to keep hold of that yellow jersey. We move on, and we're moving on uh, towards the Alps. A couple of, sort of transitional days ahead of us, or three, in fact, before the next rest day. And, yeah, we should wrap things up for tonight. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Indeed. We? Yeah. So thank you very much, Lionel. Thank, thank you earlier to Francois, who joined us. Always great to have Francois on. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. <laughs>